Hi friends, and welcome. Mr. Madsen here again, counselor at Fern Duncan Elementary School, sharing another lesson with you from our Second Step program. Remember, this Second Step program is called the Child Protection Unit, or CPU, and the focus of these lessons is on safety. First, just a couple of expectations. Number one, I want you to be an active listener. Try to find a place where you can listen without distraction, if possible. I know that can be difficult during these times where we have shared workspaces, but you'll get the most from the lesson if you can do that. Also, I want you to participate. Throughout this pr presentation, I'm going to be sharing some questions and knowledge and information, and I want you to think about it and even share out loud, okay, as if you, we were in the same room. And if there's an older person, your parents, or a grandparent, or an older sibling that could watch this lesson with you, that would be awesome because if any questions came up, they could help explain and, and help you to understand better. All right, let's get started. So we have our Ways to Stay Safe poster, or like, I like to call it the three R's. The first is recognize. This is where we recognize and we ask ourselves, is it safe? So we're using our senses, maybe our eyes, our ears. We're trying to determine if something is safe or not, okay? If we find that something is unsafe, it's dangerous and it's scary, then we need to report right away. The second R is report. Report to an adult that we trust as fast as we can, okay? And the third R is refuse. This means using words that mean no. And we're using those words that mean no um, in a strong and respectful voice, okay? It's an assertive voice. And sometimes we'll use gestures like stick our hand out to emphasize we mean no. All right. And then we also wanna talk about the always ask first rule. Always ask a parent or the person in charge first before we do anything. Okay, so we ask before we do, we ask before we go anywhere, and we ask before we take anything. So if someone's offering us a toy or a gift or food, we always ask the person in charge or our parents before we take anything, just to make sure that it's okay. So last time we talked about three different types of touches. So really quickly, I wanna remind you that your body belongs to you and you get to decide, number one, who touches you, number two, where they touch you, number three, when they can touch you, and number four, how they touch you. And you can say no to any kind of touch that you do not like, even to someone older than you. It's really important. Okay, so those three types of touches that we looked at last week were safe or good touches. These are touches that show us that people care about us. Okay, there were unsafe, bad touches. These are touches that hurt. And then there are unwanted touches, which make us feel uncomfortable or confusing. An example of that might be when we're standing in line and somebody just kicks us out of the blue. It's confusing, it's uncomfortable, it's unwanted. Those are the three types of touches. We also last time talked about consent or permission, getting permission. And we talked about that there's three parts to consent or permission. The first part is we ask. So for example, we might ask someone, can I give you a high five, okay? Then, number two is we listen. We listen for their response, okay? And their response could be yes, then we go ahead. Their response might be no, then we stop. If their response is unsure, like we're not clear, they're going, hmm, take that as a no, okay? It's not a yes if they're not sure. And then the third part of consent is to tell. So if anyone doesn't respect your boundaries when you say no and they don't respect your boundaries you need to tell an adult that you trust right away so we can help so sometimes that you might ask for consent anytime you're going to touch another person okay and this includes hugs high fives handshakes or kisses if it's a family member 
We also have to ask consent for any time that we borrow something from someone or if we're going to share something with them. We want to make sure that we have their permission. Okay, and also last time we talked about do you have a code word or a signal? And I wanted you to talk with your parents about coming up with a code word that you could use, say when you're at a friend's house, to let them know that you need their help. And it has to be a code word that you can use in a sentence. And I think my example was milkshake. That was the one that I used with my kids. If you said something like, hey dad, I really hope we can go get a milkshake soon, then I would know, okay, something's going on. I need to ask yes or no questions. I also want you to come up with a signal though. So these are for times when you um, are with your parents and you're in a sticky situation and you're not sure what to do. You can give this hand signal and they would be able to know that they need, that you need their help, okay? So a code word when you're not with your parents and a signal when you are with your parents, all right? And then lastly, I want you to remember that code words and signals are private. They're not for anyone else. They're only for you and your family to know. That's what keeps it a code word, okay? It's your way to let them know. If other people know about your code word, then the code word is compromised and we don't want that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about something called digital safety. And what I mean by digital safety is we're going to talk about how to be safe when we're on the internet or online. We're going to talk about the types of things that you can share and can't share, or shouldn't share, I should say. And we're going to talk about how sharing can be fun and a great way to connect with others. But we need to know how to keep ourselves safe when we share. We're also going to talk about being a digital citizen. And being a digital citizen helps you to contribute to a positive reputation, not only for yourself, but for others. Okay. So what is digital safety? What does it mean to be safe digitally? Okay. So we all use a variety of d devices, computers, phones, tablets, and we have to practice safety when we're using them. In this lesson, we're going to learn what information is okay to share and what isn't. Okay. We're also going to learn about digital footprints. Okay. And how every time we use one of our devices, we leave a trace. We leave a footprint of where we've been. When we share things about ourselves with other people, it helps us to get to know them and us as well, okay? But did you know that the human brain is wired to share with other people? That's right. And when your brain gets excited, you feel emotions and something called the autonomic nervous system causes you to want to share with other people. It's just built in automatically, okay? Sharing with others has a lot of cool benefits to it, okay? The first benefit is that it helps you to feel good. The second, you also learn and other people learn. And the last, it helps you to connect with other people. Sharing positive experiences helps you to remember them even. And when you share them over and over, they really get embedded in that part of your brain. Remember the hippocampus? It helps us all to learn, to share knowledge, and it helps everyone to be more informed. Okay, so there's lots of reasons to share information, but not everything is okay to share. So I want you to watch this short little video about what information is okay and not okay to share. Take a look. Take a look in the mirror. What do you see? Yourself, of course. But who are you? What makes you, you? There are lots of things. Your personality, your favorite food, your pet, or your favorite movie. 
Sharing this personal information on your phone or computer can be a lot of fun and can help you connect with other people. Sharing something fun that happened keeps a great memory alive. And sharing what you know teaches other people new ideas. Before you share, however, it's important to pause and think. Some information about you, like your full name, your address, or your date of birth, can be used to identify you individually. This information is private and should not be shared online, unless you get permission first from an adult you trust. So, when it comes to sharing about you, personal info can be okay. But private info? No way. Think before you share. With friends, with your community, and with the world. So, what information do you share online? Okay, so the video talked about sharing information and recommended that we do two things. We pause and we think before we share. So we pause and we think. We don't just click OK and send it right away. We need to be careful not to share private information. That's information that's unique, specific to each of us. Okay, Personal information, something that is common for a lot of people, is okay to share, but private, no way. So we have two things, private information and personal information. Remember, private information is information about you that can be used to identify you because it's unique to you. Some examples would be your full name, okay? No one has your full name, or your address, okay? or your phone number. Those are all examples of private information specific to you. Okay. Personal information, however, is information that cannot necessarily be used to identify you because it's true for many other people. Some examples of that are like your hair color or the city you live in. Okay. I live in Portland. And so you might not be able to find me because there's lots of people who live in Portland. Okay, it's important to remember that private information is information that's the most risky to share because it can be used to identify you individually. So now we're going to play a game, okay? And for each example that I say, I want you to determine whether it's a private or personal information, okay? Which one is it? To, add, to decide, you're going to ask yourself, is this information that would be also true for other people? If so, it's probably personal information. If not, then it's probably private. Okay, are you ready? Let's get started. So our first one, your home address. Hmm, private or personal? Think about that for a moment. If you're thinking, hey, my address is unique to me, so I'm going to say private. You are absolutely right. It's specific to you, and it identifies something specific about you. So that means it's private in nature. Good job. How about this second one? Your favorite food. Think about that for a moment. Hmm. Favorite food. Well, my favorite food is pizza, and not just pizza, but pepperoni pizza with mushrooms and tomatoes but I think a lot of people like pepperoni and mushroom and tomato pizza so I'm thinking that would probably be personal information would you agree yeah it's personal a lot of people like the same kinds of pizza but it's not just unique to me a lot of people like the same kind good job let's go to the third one your favorite music Hmm, private or personal? Is it unique to just you? A lot of other people might like the same kind of music, right? Yeah, so it sounds personal because a lot of people might like the same music, but not private. Let's see. Good job. Yeah, that is personal. Okay, last one. Your phone number. Hmm. 
Is that unique to you? Or do a lot of people have your phone number? Yeah, your phone number is unique to you, and that means it's private. Remember that private information should not be shared online. Unless, of course, you get permission from an adult that you trust, okay? That always ask first rule. But in general, private information is not shared online. Personal information, you can be pretty comfortable sharing, but you always want to be careful with any information you share, okay? Personal information can help you to connect to other people, but private information reveals things about you that could cause a problem later. Okay, digital footprint. Have you ever walked on the beach in the, at the ocean and noticed that you leave footprints? Yeah, just like leaving footprints in the sand at a beach, everywhere we go online, we leave footprints or a trace. That footprint can reveal a lot about us and it can last a really long time okay so everywhere we go depending on what we're using our computers our phones our tablets it leaves a little breadcrumb of us going there and that tells people things about us okay maybe things that we like maybe things that we're researching and that breadcrumb lasts a long time. So digital footprints are a record of what we do online. It includes the sites that we visit and the things that we post. It can also include things that others post that involve us, such as pictures or comments. Okay. So given that our digital footprints last a really long time and we're not always in control of what becomes part of our footprint, there are some responsibilities that we have when it comes to being online responsibly. It's something that we should think about, remember, pause and think before we do it. In this case, we have a responsibility both to ourselves and to others when we do something online. So what do you think some of the responsibilities for being online, both to ourselves and others? Let's take a look. So some responsibilities to ourselves. We have a responsibility sh to show our best self when we're online. So our best self, not our worst self, our best self. And we should only post things that we're comfortable showing publicly, okay? Personal things, not private things. Our responsibility to others are to get permission before we post a picture or tag someone in a picture or a comment. Okay, we need that consent. We need permission. And we have responsibilities to others to treat others online how we want to be treated. So that golden rule. Okay. So now we're going to watch a short video about what it means to be a super digital citizen of the world. Take a look. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's... Wait, who in the world are you? I'm Super Digital Citizen. Ta-da! Super Digital Citizen? Are you from another planet? Nope. Can you fly? Apparently not. And why do we need you, Mr. Superhero? Think about it. Every day, kids post, share, play, create, explore, and learn all online. The digital world can be a sinister place. So I make sure that kids are safe, responsible, and respectful. Huh, I guess we do need superheroes like you. Yep, I'm all about helping us kids make good choices. That sounds like one tough day job.
Sense says we can all be superheroes each and every day. What are your superpowers? Okay, as we saw in that video, a super digital citizen makes sure that their passwords are secure. They take care of their technology. They also ask permission before they share photos or share anything else with someone, about someone or themselves. A digital citizen is someone who uses technology responsibly and respectfully to learn, create, and participate. Okay. Super digital citizens also stand up to cyberbullying. By defending or supporting the person being bullied, taking a screenshot and reporting the bully to a trusted adult, or telling the person who's doing the bullying to cut it out. Bullying of any kind is not safe, and it's not respectful, and it's not okay. If you're being bullied, you need to report it to a trusted adult so they can help you solve the problem. Okay, so today we learned a lot about what it means to be a super digital citizen. All right, friends, thanks for joining me in today's lesson. I hope you learned something new, or at least if you didn't, that it reinforced something you knew before. Now I would like you to do the attached flip grid activity to this lesson. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.